Hi, this is Rachel, and thank you for joining me for topic 14 of our supervision curriculum. Today's topic is on consequence strategies. So as we get started, I want to first define consequence. In behavior analytic terms, consequence just means what happened after the specific behavior that we are investigating. So it's not a uh, judgment on the content of what happened after, just consequence means it happened after. Antecedent means before, consequence means after. However, when we are talking here about consequence strategies, we are talking about strategies that we are using after the occurrence of a behavior um, to change the occurrence of that behavior. Now, one consequence strategy that we have already discussed is reinforcement. Reinforcement occurs after a targeted behavior to increase or maintain the likelihood of that behavior occurring again in the future. The consequence strategies we are going to be talking about today are when you are trying to decrease the behavior that you are targeting. So increase, we're going to use reinforcement. Decrease, there's a few different things that we can do that will result in uh, decreasing the behavior or decreasing the likelihood of the behavior in the long run. So that's what we're going to discuss today. The second thing that I want to highlight and emphasize, and I will continue to um, you know, talk about this as we go through, is that we should not be using what happens after to make all of the behavior change. We will get into this in a lot more detail in the uh, behavior intervention plan uh, topic, but we should be focusing on trying to decrease the likelihood of the behavior by providing what the learner needs by helping them to advocate for themselves to get their needs met so that we can meet their needs. And then possibly, maybe there's a little bit that we would do if a specific behavior occurs that we don't want to continue in the future. So we're going to go over what these strategies are so that you can recognize them specifically so that you don't use them by accident. Um, because some of these things, as we talk through, are common strategies that people use. People in general, not behavior analysts specifically, but people in general, parents and societies, to control behavior. But as ethical behavior analysts, we should not be relying on this. We should be changing behavior through reinforcement, through prompting, through um, a proper assessment um, to determine uh, what supports our learners need. And we shouldn't be relying just on consequence strategies. But we do need to know what consequence strategies are and what they look like so that we can recognize when they are being used and not accidentally use one without taking all of the proper considerations um, uh, in, into consideration, without considering them, something like that. There we go. All right, so first we're gonna talk about extinction. So we talked about reinforcement. Reinforcement is um, uh, a consequence that will increase or maintain the likelihood of a certain behavior occurring again in the future. Extinction is no longer delivering that reinforcement. So you can't extinguish a behavior that never was reinforced. The behavior has to have been reinforced in order for you to use extinction on the behavior. Also, you'll notice that we don't use extinction on people we use extinction on behaviors. It's a, it's a process um, that talks about no longer delivering a reinforcer after a behavior. Um, it's not something we do to people, it's something we do to behaviors. We can no longer reinforce a behavior that previously received reinforcement. 
So an example of extinction uh, might be that a child who has previously been crying in order to get a toy, um, we no longer give the toy when they just cry, but when they use a communication strategy. So pointing or saying the word or using the picture. Um, that doesn't mean that we're not helping them to use those strategies. That doesn't mean we're not practicing. We're, we're setting up everything ahead of time. We are supporting them to make sure that they can use the strategy. But if they were to fall back to a previous level of just crying, we're not going to do that. We're not going to give them the toy. That would be an example of extinction. When we talked about shaping, we talked about differential reinforcement and differential reinforcement is selectively reinforcing behaviors over other behaviors. Well, if you're shaping, you might choose this sort of level of a behavior and reinforce it and then hold out for a slightly um, more comprehensive level or more, more details or, or something of um, more behavior, you've now put this other one, this previous level on extinction. And that just means that you're not reinforcing at this level anymore. You're reinforcing at that level. But we also recognize within shaping that if this level is too big of a step, you do go back, you reinforce at this previous level, and then you take smaller steps to go up. So extinction is just sort of the second half of what happens in differential reinforcement. If I'm reinforcing this behavior over this other behavior, if this other behavior previously, previously was reinforced and it is no longer reinforced, then that behavior is under extinction. So that's what extinction is. It's not, again, it's not something you do to a person. It's not ignoring. It's not completely disregarding a person or a situation. It is no longer reinforcing a behavior that previously was reinforced. Um, I'll give another example here when we talk about the extinction burst. So an extinction burst is the pattern of behavioral responding where after uh, when it's when a behavior does not meet with the reinforcement that the organism might essentially like try harder to get what previously they were getting right so picture this right your uh you take your money and you always put your money in a coke machine um between you know, somewhere near your work or whatever, right? Work or school or whatever. You put, you use this Coke machine all the time. You put your money in, you press your button and out comes your Coke. Great. One day you put your money in, you press the button and there's no Coke. What do you do? Most of us are not just going to walk away and say, oh, oh, well, it didn't work today. We're going to push the button again. We're going to push the money return slot, or we might bang on the glass, or we might, hopefully it's not glass, the plastic, or we might bang on the sides. Or if you ever notice those stickers that say like, don't tilt the machines, it's probably because somebody's sitting there shaking the machine because they put their money in and they didn't get their Coke. That is what an extinction burst is. An extinction burst is engaging in novel or more intense behaviors because you didn't get reinforcement where you previously got reinforcement. Um, the organism's not necessarily like thinking they're going to try harder, but if it helps you to kind of conceptualize it that way, you know, like, whoa, that worked before. Why isn't it working now? Maybe I didn't push the button hard enough. Maybe I need to do this. Maybe I'll do this other thing. And they engage in these other behaviors um, in an attempt to get the reinforcer that previously was very predictably available for this behavior. Now, the challenge with extinction burst is because it can sort of get worse, the behavior can get worse by increasing the intensity or engaging in new behaviors um, than it already was, right? Then whatever behavior was already being displayed, more of that behavior or more intensity of that behavior might be very challenging for the environment to manage. 
So we don't want to rely on extinction because if our behavior is going to get worse before it gets better, like, like we're not helping then, right? It's getting worse. Now, ideally an extinction burst would be like very short. The learner would try a few times, engage in a few instances, and then very quickly give up, move on, try something else instead. The challenge is, is that if our learner is already responding under an intermittent schedule of reinforcement, they're going to try for a while, right? Intermittent schedules of reinforcement maintain behaviors for longer gaps, um, which feel like extinction. Well, okay, well, I just need to do it more. I'm just going to do it more. I'm just going to amp it up a little bit. I'm just going to do it a little bit longer, right? So extinction bursts then can possibly um, stress the environment where the environment has to give in because they're not prepared for the level of an extinction burst. Um, and, and the behavior gets reinforced during an extinction burst, which means now you've reinforced it at even a more intense level. So you have to be consistent if you are going to use extinction to not reinforce during an extinction burst where the behavior may become more intense. May, there may be more of that behavior. There may be novel behaviors that are um, attempting to serve the same function. All of these are reasons why we shouldn't rely on extinction. We should be doing, and we're gonna talk about this again in the topic where we cover all the behavior intervention uh, plans. Um, we should be arranging the environment so our learner is successful. We should be teaching our learner how to get their needs met in a way that the environment can support. And then maybe, maybe there's a little piece here where extinction would be used if the behavior occurred. But if the behavior is occurring, that means that we didn't do enough to prevent it or to help our learner replace the behavior. So really that's on us. If we have to use extinction because we haven't done 90% of the work, I mean, that's on us. We should be doing all of this prep work, all this pre-work before uh, an overly adapted behavior occurs so that we don't need to rely upon extinction. But we do need to be aware that that's what extinction is. And that if extinction is used, it could result in an extinction burst um, because the behavior has been reinforced. So, um, you know, again, essentially the learner is, is trying harder because it, it always worked before. Why isn't it working now? Um, in order to effectively use extinction, if you are using it, you have to reinforce that appropriate replacement behavior. You can't just say, no, not that. No, not that. No, not that. You have to tell the learner, you have to teach the learner how to get their needs met. Extinction is just me not reinforcing that previous something that previously worked. Well, what else should the learner be doing? Um, you know, it's like if I say, don't think of an elephant. Oh, guess what? You thought of an elephant, right? Because I didn't give you anything else. <laughs> what should you be doing? Think of kangaroos, think of giraffes, think of this. Now you're not thinking of an elephant because you're thinking of those other animals, right? So you have to identify at least one, hopefully a lot of appropriate replacement behaviors for that learner to engage in to get their needs met. Otherwise, extinction you're not teaching anything um, to the learner and they are going to get their need met. They are going to get their needs met. And if you just don't reinforce this one and they try something else and you weren't prepared for it, then you then that one may get reinforced. And now that's what they're going to do, right? You haven't given them a way to get their needs met. So if you are using extinction, you should be spending a huge chunk of your time on teaching and reinforcing the appropriate replacement behavior. Um, extinction, if it's used, has to be used with extreme consistency. Like we talked about, if it's reinforced part of the time or sometimes, or when it gets, you know, too intense, 
then you're just setting the bar. You're just setting your reinforcement bar up higher now so that now the learner knows, all right, I'm going to have to try even longer. I'm going to, you know, do this even more often because eventually it does work. So everyone needs to be consistent. That's um, it needs to be consistently implemented across um, settings, across people, um, if you are relying upon this. But again, this should be the, the tiny piece, like the last maybe 10% of your strategy to change a behavior. You should first be supporting the individual so that the environment meets their needs and teaching the individual how to meet their needs um, or how to request from the environment to meet their needs, how to advocate for themselves when the environment is not meeting their needs. And then, then there might be this tiny piece here where you might need to use extinction. Um, another component to be aware of is what's called spontaneous recovery. Now, spontaneous recovery is basically say that this behavior has been extinguished and the learner hasn't engaged in that behavior for a long time but then suddenly it pops up again, right? That's spontaneous recovery. Um, again, if we go back to the, the Coke machine, the drink machine um, example, so you didn't get your money and you don't go buy it uh, for, for two weeks. And then you come by and you're like, well, they're bound to have fixed it, right? And so you put the money in and you try it again. If that's, that's the spontaneous recovery piece, right? If you get reinforced, if you get the Coke out of the machine, then you're gonna start using that again. You're gonna go right back to your previous levels because you know there was a little blip, but now you it's working again. So you're gonna keep using it again. If it's not reinforced, then you're probably gonna go longer before you try it again, right? And eventually if it never works again, any, any other time that the spontaneous recovery happens that you try it again, then eventually you're gonna stop trying because it never works anymore, right? So that's what spontaneous recovery is, is it's trying, it's that trying again, right? Sometimes we see this described as like, oh, he's testing you because it's a new person. And then the learner is doing behaviors that they don't do with anybody else, but they're doing it with the new person. Sure. Yeah. We're seeing like, okay, well, does this person reinforce this behavior or not? Um, and so you do need to be aware of those so that people can be prepared. They understand what previous strategies have been used and what, um, what the replacement behaviors are that should be being reinforced um, so that the environment can continue to support the learner in the use of those skills. And again, if you're going to extinguish a behavior, then it has to occur across all the settings. The extinction uh, procedure has to be used. And that would go again for all the other things. The environment needs to meet the learner's needs. The learner needs to be taught and have a chance to practice and is reinforced for all of those replacement behaviors. And then if you need to use extinction, it is also used, and all of those things are used across all environments. So that's extinction. Now, the next things we're going to talk about are punishment procedures. And before we jump into punishment, I do want to talk about ethically, when should we be using punishment? Punishment should only be used as a last resort if all other reinforcement techniques have not been successful. We're going to discuss these procedures so that trainees and other people, viewers, anybody listening, um, understands how punishment may already be in place in environments without people even thinking that it's punishment. If punishment procedures are used, you need to recognize them as punishment procedures and implement them ethically according to our code, which would be only as a last resort. So when we start talking about some of these things, you may see that some of these things are things that are already used in classrooms, that parents already use with their own kids. Um, 
So they, these punishment procedures may already exist in the environment. And as a behavior analyst, it's your job to try to change those environments so that they're not using punishment to change behavior, so that they're using replacement uh, strategies, they're using reinforcements and prompts uh, in order to change behavior, because ethically, we shouldn't be doing those right? So that's, I want to go in with that. We're going to talk about punishment so that we understand it so that we don't use it because it exists. So let's define punishment real quick. Reinforcement is a consequence delivered after a behavior that increases or maintains the likelihood of that behavior occurring in the future. Punishment is a consequence that occurs after a behavior that decreases the likelihood of that behavior occurring again in the future. Um, punishment does not mean that someone is necessarily delivering it. It's not like discipline or, um, yeah, it, it's not a discipline technique. It just means that this consequence that followed this behavior decrease the likelihood of that behavior in the future. And I will give you some examples. The topography, so what punish, what the punisher looks like doesn't matter if it decreased the behavior. If you touch a hot stove and you burn your fingers or the pot, right, the metal pot, and you touch it and it burns and you pull your hand away and you are less likely to touch up uh, uh, the stove or to touch a pot without a pot holder in the future that punished your behavior right so that wasn't somebody that did it to you the the action itself <laughs> met with a consequence that was a punisher it decreased the likelihood that you will put your hand on hot metal or near a stove without a pot holder in the future if you were to give me Skittles for completing chores and, and you were, you know, and I had to eat the Skittle if you gave it to me, right? I would stop doing chores because I hate Skittles. Skittles are gross. They're chewy. They get stuck in my teeth. I do not like them. I don't want Skittles. Skittles would be a punisher for me. If you give me Skittles for something, you have possibly punished the behavior that you were delivering them for. Even though other people might like Skittles, and for other people that might be a reinforcer, for me, they would be a punisher, right? So it doesn't matter what it looks like. It matters how the behavior responds in the future. So some of these things may not look like things that we think of when we think of punishers, but they are because they are, uh, if they decrease the behavior, then they are punishers. Okay, so the first one we're gonna talk about is response cost. So we've talked about token systems and token systems, uh, again, are a delivery of like a generalized condition reinforcer, like a token or a sticker or a penny or tally marks or whatever, like it doesn't matter what it is, but you accumulate those and then there's an opportunity to trade them in later. So it helps the learner to delay reinforcement, um, and you get to spend it on something that you want later. Money is a token system. We get paid in money. Money by itself doesn't get us anything, but we can spend that money on other things. So that's why we value money is because it buys us other things, not because we care about the paper or the metal. So a response cost would be um, removing part of those reinforcers generally it's got to be some sort of a token system because if you're eating the skittle every time i give it to you i can't take that skittle back right if you're engaging with the toy every time i give it to you i can't take that time back but if you're earning points if you're earning tokens and then there's a behavior that occurs that we are punishing this is a punishment um strategy even though we shouldn't be using them, you will see that response costs happens. Um, if it's taken away, that's your response cost. I don't know if that was a clear sentence. <laughs> when a portion of a reinforcer is lost following the occurrence of 
that targeted behavior, that overly adapted behavior, that's response cost. If you are caught speeding and you have to pay a fine, that is a response cost. Um, our systems, uh, as far as like uh, laws, are often response cost. Pay the money, and um, and that's the penalty, right? Which, um, so so people are very familiar with having to pay for it, right? Sometimes you might see that um, if a teacher, if a kid is acting up in the classroom, the teacher may take away some of their recess minutes, right? Um, that would be an example of a response cost. So a response cost is the removal of the reinforcer or portions of the reinforcer contingent upon that behavior that you're trying to decrease. Now, again, another thing that I want to cover about punishment is that punishment does not consider function. And we talked about function and we're going to continue to talk about function in the future as well. Punishment doesn't consider function. Extinction considered function because we have to know what the reinforcer is to not reinforce something. Um, but punishment doesn't. Punishment doesn't look at the function, which is why it is, I would say, I don't have data to back this up. This is my experience. Uh, not as effective because you're not meeting the needs of the learner. You're just telling them, no, don't do that, right? You're telling them not this one, not this one, not this one, but you're not telling them what to do instead, right? It's like if you only used extinction. No, I'm not giving you a treat now, but you didn't tell them what they should be doing instead, okay? So all of this to say, um, response cost is not considering function, um, which means that all you're telling the learner, all you're teaching the learner is not this. If you do this, you're going to lose some of your reinforcer, but you haven't told the learner what they should be doing instead, how to meet their needs in another way, what's more appropriate for them to do. You're just doing not this, okay? So a response cost system, if one was to effectively use a response cost, which most of the times when you see response cost systems in place in, in the natural environment already, they're not even effectively being used. But if you were to use a response cost, to effectively use a response cost, you might need to deliver reinforcement at a higher rate so that you can make up for any time the learner is using it. Because again, our goal is that they receive more reinforcement so that we're reinforcing the appropriate behaviors than just punishing uh, the behaviors that we don't want to see because again, we're not teaching them what to do instead. Also, you might have to have reinforcers to start with. If you start with zero points and the very first thing that the individual does would result in losing a point, they don't have anything left to lose. And I think you will see this in, in society sometimes. It's like, well, I don't have anything. I don't have any money, so you can't really find me. Um, so if you can't find me, then what? You're gonna put me in jail well, okay, but that provides food and roof over my head, and I don't have those things on a day-to-day -day basis. So this that would not be very effective to decrease the likelihood of someone engaging in a behavior that we consider a crime if they can't pay the fine anyway, right? So it doesn't matter, right? So if you are going to use a response cost, the individual has to have enough of whatever you you would be giving them or taking away so that it would be meaningful if they lost some. Um, you also can't threaten the removal of the reinforcer. You either do it or you don't. You either take the or you don't take it. Um, but if you just say, oh, if you do that again, I'm gonna take it, I'm gonna take your point, then the learner just learns they have some wiggle room that you're not going to take it away the first time um, that, you know, they got one or two tries um, before 
you do something. My mom used to do this. Um, she would count down if you, you know, blah, 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 by the count of three, one, two, two and a half, two and three quarters. She didn't want to come. She didn't want to say three and have to follow through either. I get it. But we just learned as kids that like, you don't have to really do whatever it was she wanted until she got to like two and a half. Cause then, then she was probably going to actually come up there. Right. So it just teaches the learner that there's wiggle room. Um, so if you were going to use response costs effectively, the learner needs to already have reinforcers to start with. They need to be earning reinforcers at a faster rate than they are losing them. And that you can't threaten the removal of a reinforcer. If, if, they engage in the behavior, then you would remove that token. Um, again, I'm stressing here. <laughs> we don't need to do these. There are so many ways to teach and reinforce and support our learners, but you need to recognize that this is a punishment system and that you as a behavior analyst should not be using punishment without going through a ton of reinforcement strategies first and going through um, a ton of protocols to make sure that you are, that this is, makes the most sense, right? And again, punishment doesn't consider function. So if you went with a function-based intervention, you would probably have more success anyway. Another form of punishment is overcorrection. So overcorrection is a procedure that requires the individual to restore the environment to its original state or better, or to practice the behavior that they should have used in the situation instead. So those are two types. Restitutional is where you restore the environment to what it was before the behavior occurred, or maybe a little bit better. So for instance, if the individual throws a box of Legos, they have to clean up all the Lego bricks and also maybe the other toys that are on the floor in the room. That would be an example of restitutional overcorrection. Um, positive practice is when you have to practice what the, they should have done instead. Um, more times. So for example, if the individual threw the Lego, then they would have to practice putting it into the box nicely several times. So positive practice is designed uh, to be used when the individual has demonstrated that they can perform the replacement behavior, um, but they didn't demonstrate it this time. So the idea is that they would practice the right way to do it multiple times so that hopefully that would decrease the likelihood of them engaging in the uh, other behavior instead. Now, again, overcorrection, whether it's restitutional or positive practice, does not consider function. So I don't know why my learner did this. Um, so it's not telling my learner how to better meet their needs. It's just having them fix it, right? And you're probably thinking like, well, this is a lot of what we see um, seen as sort of like maybe natural consequence type stuff. Well, they met, made a mess, so then they have to clean it up. Um, or they ran down the hall, so I made them go back and walk down the hall the right way. Um, if the idea behind those things is to decrease the likelihood that they did it the wrong way the first time, those are punishment. If it decreases the likelihood that they um, run down the hall or that they throw the blocks or whatever it is, that's punishment, okay? So if we want to teach the appropriate behavior, um, like positive practice is having them practice what they should do instead, we should just teach it. We should teach it outside of when the overly adapted behavior occurs. Um, if we want a learner to take responsibility for something, uh, a mess that they made, 
you can have them clean up the mess, but if you have them clean up everything, that's the overcorrection part, right? Like that's the idea. Why would you have them clean up more than the mess they made unless you were trying to discourage them from cleaning up the mess in the future, right? Or from making the mess in the future. I said that right. <laughs> you would, if you just, you know, if I spill my orange juice, right? That's an accident. Okay, I clean up my orange juice, not a big deal. If I spill my orange juice and then I have to clean up my orange juice and then I have to clean the whole table and then I have to clean the whole floor, like what is the purpose of that? The, the purpose would be to decrease the likelihood that I spill my orange juice in the future. That's punishment, right? So it's a punishment procedure. Overcorrection is a punishment procedure. Um, some things to remember if overcorrection is being used that you cannot reinforce during the overcorrection because you might create a cycle where the learner engages in an overly adapted behavior. You engage in um, trying to get them to do the overcorrection procedure, and then they get reinforcement from that. Again, this is where punishment doesn't consider the function, but if you knew the function, then you could determine whether or not um, the overcorrection procedure would be reinforcing. So for example, if my learner um, likes adult attention, but they're in a large classroom and they don't get a lot of adult attention, if they learn that Oh, well, if I make a mess, then the teacher comes over and gives me a lot of one-on-one -on -one attention as they're making me clean it all up and they're helping me clean it all up. And then they praise me because I'm cleaning it all up. Then I might make messes a lot more because I like the uh, adult attention that I get after it, right? If that's the case, then this isn't going to be a punishment because procedure because it's not going to decrease the likelihood, right? Um, so what's the point? Why would we make the kid do this, right? So you can't reinforce. So you have to know what the learner's reinforcers are. You might need to physically prompt or assist them because if they already engaged in a behavior and now you're making them do more to fix that behavior, they're not likely to comply. And if you were going to try to provide prompts and they're not going to um, uh, engage with those prompts, then you're stuck, right? You can't force somebody to clean up if they aren't, if they don't want to clean up, right? So then you're just sitting there, right? So you have no follow through here. Um, and you should be prepared for our protest behaviors. So in all reality, <laughs> in my experience, overcorrection is extremely difficult on the provider to even implement correctly without there being like so much unnecessary um, escalation of behaviors. And you're not even addressing the learner's needs. So again, recognize that this is a punishment procedure that you have probably seen and maybe experienced um, but we as behavior analysts need to not use this, not program for, well, he made a mess. He needs to clean up the whole mess and the whole room so that he learns not to make a mess in the future. Like, no, there are other ways to teach that besides overcorrection. Punishment is not going to teach new behaviors. Punishment is only going to teach what not to do. All right. The next one is timeout, which again is a popular parenting strategy. So this is something that you have probably seen in multiple environments. You may have experienced, you may have used with your own kids. Time out, the full phrase is time out from positive reinforcement. So this one, you do need to consider function a little bit because you have to know what the learner's reinforcers are in order to take a timeout from those reinforcers. So in a timeout, the individual um, is, is 
not given access to or removed from access to positive reinforcement for a predetermined length of time. Um, and the idea is that if when the learner engages in the behavior, they're immediately removed from all the fun, then they will be less likely to engage in that behavior in the future because they want to stay in the fun, right? But you have to know what the fun is. Otherwise, you can't implement this correctly. Um, there are a few things with time out. There's exclusionary timeout, which means that the individual is actually moved to a different setting. Maybe they're moved to a different room or moved to a different portion of the room. There's non-exclusionary timeout, which means that the learner is not removed, but they don't get access. So for example, um, when I was in a childcare setting, we as teachers were taught to give the learners sit and watch um, if they engaged in things like yanking toys from or hitting um, from another uh, to appear, right? Preschoolers. And what we would do is we would have them just sit down where they were in the center, but they couldn't play with the toys and they sat for a minute and then they stood back up and they could play with the toys again, right? So they're not being removed, they're still there, but they can't participate. Um, I've also seen it done where it's like you have to have a bracelet to have your turn in the game or whatever. I think this was with middle school students. And if they engaged in a behavior that was unacceptable or they their bracelet was taken off, they didn't have their bracelet, they couldn't take their turn when the time was up, then they got their bracelet let back, they could take their turn. Again, timeout is a punishment. We should not be relying upon punishments. Um, we should be teaching the appropriate behaviors and helping to figure out why the individual is engaging in this particular behavior and what they could engage in instead to better meet their needs. Some common errors in implementing timeout. Um, often uh, people cite the rule uh, one minute in timeout for each year that the individual is old. Honestly, the data says that's way too long. A minute to three minutes is what the data supports. And you want your learner to be calm, quiet for a minimum of like five to 10 seconds at the end of that, right? If they're still screaming, if they're screaming, <laughs> if they're throwing a fit, they're not ready to re-engage yet. But once they're calm, let them come back in and re-engage, right? Um, you don't always have to move the individual to another environment. In fact, physically trying to move somebody who doesn't want to move is problematic, right? Is, is escalating things when they don't need to be. Um, also, you might see uh, another common error is uh, interacting with the individual while they are in timeout. So uh, attention and that engagement can be a reinforcer. If you are delivering that one-on-one -on -one attention after the individual has done something that you put them in timeout for, again, you could sort of create this cycle where they're like, oh, I'm not getting enough attention. I'm going to do this. They put me in timeout. Then they come and they talk to me. And now I get what I really wanted out of it, right? So if you did want to talk about what could we have done instead, right? You wait until the learner is engaged appropriately again, and then you would have that discussion, which means you could also have that discussion before the behavior were to occur because you are choosing to teach at a time when they're already engaged and, um, and doing well. That's when you can practice the skills that you want them to be using. Um, and then we said, you know, time out. Uh, we don't want the time out to end if the individual is not calm and ready to resume right? If they are still elevated, still agitated, um, still worked up, then they're just not ready to come back. But as soon as they're calm, then they come back, right? Now, here's the piece that also is a, a big um, challenge. Time in environment has to be, in, has to be enjoyable. <laughs> if 
our learner doesn't want to be in the environment. And so then contingent upon a behavior, you send them out, you have reinforced it. If my learner doesn't want to do math, and so they're being disruptive, and so you send them out into the hall and they don't have to do math, you've potentially reinforced that behavior. You haven't punished it. You're not decreasing the disruption. You're reinforcing, you're teaching them, great, you want out? I will let you out. Here's how to get out is to engage in these other behaviors. So again, we need to know the function of the learner's behavior to have the environment meet the learner's needs, teach the learner how to self-advocate to get their needs met, um, because punishment is not taking those things into consideration. And therefore, even if we are attempting to use a punishment strategy, we could be reinforcing a behavior because we don't know what the learner's reinforcers are. All right, so that was a lot. <laughs> Here's our assignment. Define extinction and provide an example for each of the four commonly identified functions. So we talked about functions before and the four real functions are social positive, social negative, automatic positive, automatic negative. But let's talk about the social ones that people generally discuss and encounter. Um, attention, tangible, escape, and sensory. What would extinction look like? Now remember, extinction is no longer delivering the reinforcer. So if I know my if reinforcer is attention, extinction would be not giving attention. Um, if I know my reinforcer is tangible, extinction would be not giving the tangible. Now, what would that look like, right? Um, I didn't touch upon it. I should have gone into more detail. Let's just do a side note here. Um, extinction. Uh, when we talk about extinction for attention, no longer give attention, there are several ways that that could look. It does not mean ignore everything. Um, we could not deliver attention for the behavior, but still deliver attention to the person. So for example, if I have a learner who's maybe tapping their pen, trying to get me to say something, right? We've determined that they tap their pen to try and get a reaction, try and get some attention. And they're tapping their pen. I could engage with the learner like normal, like I would normally be talking to them or teaching with them or whatever we would be doing. And I just don't comment about the pen tapping. And eventually they wouldn't tap their pen anymore because the, if, if the function was just to get my attention to say something about the pen and I never say anything about the pen, then they'll find something else because I'm also giving them attention for all the other things that they're doing. On the flip side, sometimes our learner might engage in a behavior that is not safe and we need to maintain safety. So we can't ignore the behavior. We need to attend to the behavior, but we don't need to deliver a ton of attention for it, right? So if I have a learner that's standing on a desk, standing on a chair, and I'd like for their feet to be on the floor, but currently they're on the desk. I don't have to go up to the learner and be like, you need to come down, that's unsafe, da 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 and talking to them and delivering a lot of that attention. I can brace the table, I can brace the chair that they're on to make sure it doesn't tip over because that's the risk, right? That's our concern if someone's climbing on furniture is that they're going to fall. Great, brace it so that they don't fall, they can't tip it over. Um, now they're safe, but you don't have to talk about it, right? And you can just wait until they come back down. Um, so the, there's, there's different ways you can do that. It does not mean ignore everything because you do need to monitor safety, but you don't have to comment on the behavior itself. Same thing when we talk about extinction for escape behaviors. Escape behaviors would be trying to get out of having to do a specific task. So extinction for escape would be not allowing getting out, which basically means to complete the task. Well, that does not mean that I manhandle somebody to physically make them do something that they do not want to do. That is not escape extinction. That is not what that means. It could mean that we just wait. I wait until you're ready. You know, as soon as you put on your shoes, 
we can go outside and we wait. I can help you if you want, you know, like whatever it is, right? But first shoes, then we go outside. Um, first buckle up, then we can drive to the park, to the toy store, to the whatever, right? Um, that could be what escape extinction would look like. Or for some situations, like especially when you talk about things like school, where there's a schedule and you have to move on to the next thing, that it just sort of stays on that to-do list, right? Like, you know, okay, well, when we come into math tomorrow, this is what we're gonna do. We're gonna still come back to this particular work, right? This is the work we're going to do. Now, again, extinction should not be used on its own. It should be like e this little eeny tiny bit of this huge behavior plan that you are doing for this learner. Where's my hand? There it goes. You know, you should be doing like 90% other work, maybe, maybe 10% you would need to use extinction. So you shouldn't be relying upon this to do all the teaching. You should be doing all the teaching here. And if you're doing all of this, they may never engage in the behavior. So you never need to use extinction because you have appropriately arranged the environment and supported them and taught them to self-advocate and helped them so that you don't they don't need that behavior because that other behavior is no longer effective, right? Okay, so that was a side note to assignment one. <laughs> Two, describe a timeout procedure. Three, describe a response cost system. Four, define the two types of overcorrection. And number five is a little tricky. Provide an operational definition for responding to an overly adapted behavior when you don't have the specific behavior plan yet. So you don't know the function yet, okay? So this is tricky because this is often where we get into situations where we just do something because we don't know what to do, right? Well, I'm gonna use punishment because I don't know what the function is. You don't need to use punishment just because you don't know the function. You need to potentially consider what extinction would look like for all of the functions so that you could respond in a way that is least likely to create a reinforcement pattern for the future. And then before it occurs a second time, you do determine the function and you figure out what your behavior plan is so that you have a behavior plan. But in the moment, you need to give people a strategy as to like, well, what if all of a sudden my learner does blank, right? They've never done it before, but all of a sudden they just do something new. How do I respond? Okay, that's what you would write. Write an operational definition for what should somebody do? And, and really, I'll tell you what it is, is you figure out, you describe what um, they should do that would be least likely to reinforce any of the uh, possible reinforcers, right? Least amount of attention, um, least amount of escape, least amount of tangible. Um, that's what you would need to do to have a plan for if something occurs the first time, how do I respond to it? All right. So that was a very long topic. Thanks for hanging in there. Um, again, to recap, we cover extinction and punishment procedures so that we can recognize them and so that we can program without using them, without relying on punishment or relying exclusively on extinction because that is not the best way to do things, okay? But we need to cover them so that we can understand these principles, so that we can recognize them, so that we can avoid them, okay? Thank you very much. Please subscribe if you want to see more of this content and continue to see our supervision curriculum. And feel free to um, ask questions or place answers to the uh, assignment in the uh, comments, and I will be happy to provide feedback there. Thank you so much.